Are you living the good life? When you wake up in the morning, when you go throughout your day, when you put your head on the pillow at the end of that day, are you able to say, ah, I am living the good life. I am definitely living the good life. Now, as I ask that question, I'm not talking about the good life as defined by beer commercials, by music videos, by automobile ads. You know, the worldly definition of the good life, give me the goods. That's the good life. Girls, gold, and glory, the three G's as I talk about it with guys sometimes. Pleasure, possessions, prestige. The Beverly Hillbillies, you remember that song? Swimming pools, movie stars. You know, that kind of mentality. That's not the good life that I'm talking about. The question is actually a lot deeper than that. Are you living the good life? Are you living a life that you can look at and say, life is good. It has meaning. It has purpose. Do you know why you're here on this planet? Do you know what will happen to you after you're no longer here on this planet? Are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with others around you? Are you at peace with yourself? And some of you might say at that point, well, you know what? I'm not living any kind of good life. Not by the world's definition, not by God's words definition, as you just said it. You don't understand, Pastor Scott. I'm going through a tough time. I'm going through some dark days and difficult times. I have way too much bad going on in my life to feel good or to call it the good life. Well, if that's the case for you, I'm really glad you're here tonight. Why? Because we are studying the last half of 1 Peter 3. And you see, the times were tough, the days were dark when Peter wrote this letter. And the overarching theme of this chapter, as we're going to see, is how to have, how to live the good life, even when some things are bad. See, Peter was writing to persecuted people. He was writing to pressured people. They were facing the very real loss of many of the things that we've already talked about here. You know, losing property, losing maybe even their life for the faith that they had found. And yet Peter gives them some simple secrets here and to us also by extension for loving life, for living life, the good life, right here, right now, even when things aren't always perfect. And if I could boil it down to a single sentence for us to think on, for us to remember, it's the good life is the God life. The good life is the God life. Next time you see a commercial that says something different, you can know in your mind, hey, the good life is really the God life. Now, what do I mean by the God life? What I mean by that is a life focused on God, a, God, a life following God, a good life, doing good, being good. And the great lie of Satan is that the sure way to have a bad and boring life is to do what is good, to do what is to do with God. You know, that chasing sin, that's going to bring me happiness. You know, pleasing myself, that's going to do it for me. And that God is really out somehow to take everything good out of our lives and to spoil all our fun. And so the world will try to tempt us. It'll try to tell us. It'll try to teach us that we can have a good life apart from the God life. That that's where we're going to find the good life. But again, we need to remember that simple thought. The good life, well, it is found in one place, the God life. And so let's look together at 1 Peter 3. We'll look at this half of the chapter tonight all the way through verse 22. And it says there in verse 10, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, again, if you were here last week, that's partially a review because Pastor Pedro covered these verses in detail. And I'm just going to kind of springboard off of these to see that it really is a continuous thought into the rest of the chapter. But he's saying there in verse 10, he who would love life, see good days. You might kind of expect at that point, if you've been listening to modern media anyway, a phrase that would point to what the world calls the good life this way. If you want to love life, you want to see good days, Make a lot of money. 
Pursue pleasure and possessions. Go for those things. Nice cars, nice houses, travel and treasures. Those are the things you want. Focus on things if you want to have the good life. But you know what? Peter's first focus is not on good things, but on good relationships. Good relationships. See, when you really think about what makes a person's life good, isn't it so often the good friends, the good circle of relationships that that person has, or the lack thereof? See, when you think about it, if you want to love life, you want to see good days, well, the first thing we're going to talk about here tonight is good relationships. Good relationships. And that comes so much down sometimes to something so practical here that he talks about, which is taming the tongue. Refraining from speaking evil and deceitful things. Because evil speech, nothing ruins relationships quite like the tongue. Evil speech, and I'm not talking just here about cursing, you know, or cursing somebody out, although, of course, that's probably going to ruin some of your relationships. But I'm talking about maybe the more subtle sins, you know, complaining. A evil speech there could just simply be complaining about how bad life is. Have you ever been around someone who makes bad days worse? You're already saying, well, this isn't the greatest of days. And then you run into that person, and you're like, oh, wow, it just went from bad to worse. You know, this person with their evil speech is just going to bum me out further. You know, and you try and take that turn and get away. You know, they're just going to say, well, how are you? Horrible. You know, I don't know how this can happen to me. This is always happening to me. You know, man, 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 that sort of thing. Why me? Why me? Why me? And that sort of thing. I hate my life. It's so terrible. And on the other hand, we can have people who when you meet them, maybe you're having a bad day until you meet them. And then you see, man, it took a turn, a sudden turn for the better. An encourager, someone who lifts you up with their words. Maybe they are having some struggles. Maybe they are having some difficulties. But at the same time, instead of a mutual bum-out session, it can actually become a lifting of each other. Don't you love being around people like that? And see, here's the thing. If you love being around people like that, wouldn't you want to be people like that? That's the thing that really is the challenge here is that you could ask yourself, we can ask ourselves, we can evaluate, what kind of person am I? Am I the person I would want to avoid? Or am I the person I would want to seek out on one of my harder days? See, the good life doesn't depend so much on externals. A lot of it has to do with internals. It has to do with what's going on inside. And inevitably, what's going on inside, Jesus said, would make it to the outside. See, we wouldn't be able to hide it for long. Now, we took a... Family vacation, that's an oxymoron if ever there was one, you know. But we took a family vacation once to Disney, you know. And one of the things I learned there, I learned a lot there. But you know what I noticed? You see a lot of really miserable people in the Magic Kingdom. I don't know what it is. I guess the magic has worn off in some ways after the second or third day. The family's fighting, you know, just letting each other have it, complaining, crying, we're going to go home, I'll take you out of the car, and we'll never, you know, and that's the husband and wife talking to each other. <laughs> but you see all that, you know, and you think, man, you would think, the Magic Kingdom, isn't it called the happiest place on earth? I mean, if you want to live the good life and love your life and see good days, wouldn't you think Disney would be the place to go and that you could have that litter-free streets? You know, they have people coming along, cleaning everything up, happy music, you know, la, 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 all everywhere you go, smiling cartoon characters, you know, people with permanent plastic smiles on their face, entertainment everywhere you look, you know, shows, so many shows you can't see them all in a day. And you see that all the good externals that someone can come up with in the world cannot make up for a person who has an internal issue. Because again, Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I just said that, I didn't mean it. Well, you know what? Jesus suggests otherwise. You know, that what's going on and what's growing in our heart is exactly what will come out of our mouth. And if you want to look at a life and say, hey, is that a good life? Well, what he's saying here is refrain from evil speech, from gossip, from boasting, from bickering, from complaining. And some of you would be honest enough to say, but Pastor Scott, if I give up all that stuff, what will I talk about? I'll have so many rollover minutes at the end of the month, I won't know what to do with them all. Well, try this one. What he's doing here, train your tongue to speak the words and truths of God. That's what Peter's doing. Peter was a guy who had plenty of 
mouth problems earlier in his life. But you see him doing something so different here, which is quoting in his writing Psalm 34. That's what he's doing as he does this, quoting God's word. And if we hide God's word in our heart, it's going to change the way we talk. That's for sure. But it's also going to change the way we walk. You see that in verse 11. It says, let him turn away from evil and do good. This isn't just the way you talk, but the way you walk. He says, let him seek peace and pursue it. So again, do you want to love life? I think everyone does. Do you want to see good days? Do you want to live the good life? Man, it's not just a matter of your talk, but your walk. He says, turn away from evil. Walk away from wickedness. Say no to sin. And again, many would say, but wait a minute. Won't I miss out on the good life? I mean, the Miller high life, right? Can anyone vouch for the fact that it's really the Miller low life? And in time, the Miller no life pretty soon? See, if God says something is bad, there's a reason he says that. You know what it is? It's because it's bad. It's not that he just looked arbitrarily and stuck stickers on things and says, eh, let's put bad on that, good on this, bad on this, bad on that. No, he actually had a reason that he would put those things and those understandings for us. One of the things is that not everything that looks good at first is really good in the last. See, God, again, didn't just arbitrarily label those things. He did it for our benefit. Sin is pleasurable. See, anyone who tells you anything different is, is really not being truthful with you. The Bible says sin is pleasurable, but it goes on to say for a season. See, and seasons change. And the price tag, well, it's usually Satan's deal is get it now and pay later. Don't worry about the price. And see, this is the thing. So often we say, this is fun. This is great. I'm loving life. Man, I am living the good life right now. And that's exactly what the prodigal son thought. You know, in Luke 15, that familiar parable that Jesus told about the guy who went off to live the good life. He said, I want the money. I want to go chase the things that matter most in life. And he started out the life of the party, but he ended up, he ended up in a pig pen. And that's always the progression or the digression there. So you want to see good things in life? You want to live the good life? Turn away from evil. Turn toward the good and do it. Don't just know it, do it. See, I think good gets a bad rap. I think God gets a bad rap. You know, a lot of times people have this idea of Christianity that God is boring. You know, that God's all about you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this. You know what? There's far more that you can do than that you cannot do. You know, when you think about the garden, what was it? It was one tree you couldn't touch and everything else that you could. So, so often people will focus on the one thing that I can't and never think about the many things that you can't. See, God is anything but boring. Christianity is about actively, aggressively, enthusiastically and with abandon doing good and nobody who sees how bad the world is and how much the world needs some good in it could ever be bored with that mission it's exciting you see Satan's lie is that the way to love life and see good days is to put yourself first and to live selfishly but if you think about it really what you probably learned even in your own life is that the more you try to please yourself, the less satisfied you become. And some of the most meaningful moments of life are when you do something for somebody else. And so the review, again, the good life, the God life, that's exactly what Jesus taught, that it's there in good relationships. You want to see good life? Focus on your family. Focus on your friends. Focus on God's family here. If you say, well, I don't have family. Well, you have family here. That's one of the things God has promised us. So make sure you have friends and make sure you have the most important friendship that he talked about in here, which is that friendship with God. That is the one that will really affect how you walk, how you talk, and how you relate to everybody else. You love God, you'll find yourself able to love others. You don't love God, eh, people aren't that lovable anyway. You're going to have a lot of struggles. And so it says there, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. That's a good thing to remember. His ears are open to their prayers. See, that's good to know. I don't know about this, but this doesn't sound good. I don't know what it means exactly, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
Well, I don't want the face of the Lord against me, whatever it is. You know, if you think about a parent, it, when their face is against you, you know that look that the parents could give, and whoa, just with a look, no, that's, that's all I need to know. Now, does this verse here that if you're on God's side, he'll be on your side, does that really mean that there will never be anything bad that comes into your life if you're living the God life? There's some people who think that. There's some people who expect that. I don't want to pop your bubble here. But that's too simplistic. That is just optimistic. That's not really realistic. See, the Bible says something very, very different, and it's exactly what our experience teaches if we pay attention. The Scriptures say something much more profound than that good things happen to good people and bad people have bad things happen to them and that sort of thing. What is it that the Bible actually says? This is what it says. That when you have the God life, that when you have God's life living within you, whether something is good or bad, the ultimate outcome is good. And that's why you see it's not just about good relationships, the good life. It's about good results, a long-term perspective that starts to see, you know what, no matter what it is, it's like it goes through this big grinder and whatever comes out the other side, it's always good when it's God. No matter what you put in, it's like sausage, you know. I don't know what goes in there, but man, sausage tastes good. And it's just like, I don't want to know what goes in there. Good and bad, who cares? It's all good when it comes out the other side. And so he says there, who's going to harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, see, you are blessed. In other words, no matter what. Good comes out. Don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. See, in general, what he's giving here, Peter's, Peter's giving a principle, which is that a person, if they are a good person, if they're a godly person, if they're just a generous, loving, caring person, in general, they will find themselves with few enemies and many friends. So that's just the general rule. If you look around, you know, nice people tend to have nice people around them, good relationships and all that. But there are exceptions to this rule. You want to find one? Well, it's right there in verse 14. Never forget this, that Jesus was all good, and yet, what was the end of him? Well, crucifixion, right? Acts 10, 38, if you jot this one down, it's a great summary of his life. Don't turn there because it's going to be over before you even get there. But this is what it says, Acts 10, 38. Jesus went around doing good. And it says, because God was with him. And you would think, okay, guy does good, God is with him, everything's good, right? But again, he was crucified. How do you explain that, Scott? How do you explain that? Well, I don't have to, because God's word does, which is that the God life, the good life, if you want to look at that, is that even when life is bad, even when bad people come into a good and godly life, the ultimate guarantee of God is, Good's going to result. There's going to be a good result. And see, at the cross, like nowhere else, God took the worst that evil mankind was capable of, the very worst that we could do, and he turned it into God's best. The most amazing turnaround that has ever been. And the bad actions of bad people ultimately had good results well, for us even here today in the life of Jesus. And God has promised the exact same principle to be true in each one of us. You want to love life? You want to see good days? You want to live the good life? Well, I do. And the Bible tells us how. It says, trust in God through the good times and the bad times, and you will find Romans 8.28 is true. What's it say? It says God works all things. It, that's, you could put it in parentheses right there, good things and bad things, for the good of those who love him. So you put in bad, you get out good. You put in good, you get out good when it goes into God's grinder. And the good result, hey, I love it. Because in the end, what it means, we win. No matter what. Okay, you think about a game you play where you say, okay, if I do good and you do good, I win. I like that game. Okay, here's a game. I do good and you do evil and I still win. I like that game. It's just what God's saying that you will be blessed. Even if someone does you wrong for doing good, God will do you right for doing good. And that's the eternal reward. And, and so it's such a popular saying in our modern society. It's all good. It's good. You need some water? I'm good. Oh, it's all good. Everything's good. But you know what? 
Only Christians can really say that. If you're not a believer here today, it's not all good. I hate to tell you. And so you think about those things, guaranteed good results. Only God can give those even from the bad events. Genesis 50, 20, a beautiful little phrase to know. You can go read the whole story of Joseph when you go home. It culminates in this. I don't want to ruin the spoiler for you, so if you don't like spoilers on stories, you know, go ahead and close your ears now. But this is what it says at the end of his life. His life went up and down, up and down, good and bad. Everything, every day was different. But, you know, you think about it, at the very end he says, you meant this for evil to his brothers, who were bad brothers, he said, you meant this for evil, and it was evil. He said, but God meant it for good. God turned it around for good, as it is today, the saving of many lives. He did it in the life of Joseph. He did it all throughout the Scripture. And most importantly and most obviously, he did it in the life of Jesus, and he has promised to do it in the life of the followers of Jesus. And that's a great reason to be one. Good results. You see that in verse 15. Look at it with me there in verse 15 of chapter 3, it says, but sanctify. Sanctify just means set apart. Enthrone, it says, the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you, with meekness and with fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it's better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for evil. So again, just a quick review. The good life is the God life. Just keep that in mind. And it's going to lead to good relationships. It's going to lead to good results. But this is the third thing I want to share with you. It's really the rest of the chapter. It says good reasons. You have good reasons to believe these things. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not when I wish upon a star and all that kind of stuff. No, we're talking a factual faith. And so he says, always be ready, always be prepared to give a response, a reason, a defense, an answer for the hope that you have, because you have a hope that others don't. And so we get a really unique opportunity. We always have the ab availability of sharing the truth, but there's something special that happens in tough times. See, anyone can share about how they love life when life is good, right? You got the uh, little spot on the beach there like Pastor Pedro has right now. You have the cool breeze on your face, like Pastor Pedro has right now. He's hopefully watching us right now. Enjoy the good life there, bro. But <laughs> wanted to let you, we love you. Just wanted to let you know that a lot of times people can say, well, that's why you love life. That's why, because look how good God has been to you. But you know what? When things are tough, and every life has those times, when things look really bad, and when you still have that hope inside, then there's going to be some people with questions. The same people who had lots of answers during other times in life may come to you with questions all of a sudden. Say, wait a minute. How can you feel so good when things look so bad? How can you have good relationships with the people around you even in tough times? How can you have a good relationship with God? How can you trust that there's good results and these good reasons. Well, again, check the context here. I want you to see it. He talks about good conscience. He talks about good conduct. He talks about good reputation. He talks about good character in there. All of these things so important. And, you know, remember, it's great because we don't follow this JC, you know, Jiminy Cricket. Remember him? Always let your conscience be your guide. You know, here's the thing. It talks here about a good conscience. What's a good conscience? A God conscience. See, because a conscience can be messed up. That's the problem here. It's kind of like a smoke alarm. Think of it this way. In our house for a while, we had smoke alarms going off in the middle of the night. <coughs> False alarms. After a while, you know what I did? Yank. Just pulled them out. I said, burn, baby, burn. I, I don't care. I don't care. I just need sleep, you know? Now, I did return to my rational mind, my care of the family and everything else and got them all fixed and all that sort of thing. But here's the thing. Sometimes a person can have a messed up conscience that's too sensitive. You know, they always think God's mad at them and every mistake they make, they think they've gone off the cliff and everything. And you're like, chill, chill. And then you have somebody else who has a seared conscience and the whole thing can be burning like hell and they just look at their life and say, I don't smell anything. I don't hear anything. No alarms are going off in me. You say, wait a minute, 
A good conscience is one trained by God's word. That's how you get a good conscience. Good conduct. That's a life that says when it hears that conscience saying this is the way to walk, go in it, that you actually do it. And it's wonderful freedom because you don't have to hide. You don't have to scheme. You don't have to be all of these things that are so troubling to our souls when you just can sleep in peace because, hey, the alarm of God is there trained by God saying, hey, you're okay with me. Everything's fine. Everything's good. Or when he goes, beep, 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 smells like smoke. Something's going on. See, you think about it. Where does the good life really come from? Again, it comes from God. See, what reason should we give when people ask? Well, I'm, yeah, I couldn't help but notice that you're good. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, no. What better answer than could anyone give than verse 18? I, I think Peter hit a verse that if you don't have it highlighted already, please just circle the whole thing, star it. It, it makes it clear where the goodness comes from in life. It sure is in us. Verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, Peter peppers the word all over here, the word good, all over this chapter, you know? Good days. You want to see good days? Do good. Follow what's good. Good conscience. Good conduct. Doing good. All of these things. And some might come to the wrong conclusion at that point and say, well, good, Peter. I'll just be good. I guess that's all I need, right? I'll just be good. I don't need God. I'll just be good. Their philosophy of life, just do good out there. Just go out there and into the bad world and just do good out there. How do you get to heaven? Be good, right? Well, how good? Well, you know, better than bad. I don't know. Pick someone bad and be better than them. And Hope that God will, you know, pick between the two of you or something. Live a good life, you know. Do some good deeds. Talk nice. Walk nice. Help someone across the street now and then or something. Be a good person. That's what, that's what it takes for God to accept you. There's, that sounds good, right? I mean, our, most of our society's fallen for it. There's one problem with it. It isn't true. It's not possible to be good enough for God because the standard of goodness that God accepts is perfection. See, and if being a good person was good enough, then it begs a little question here, which is, why did Jesus have to die? Why would God send his son if good was good enough? There'd be something bad about that, wouldn't there? And so the good news is so good because the bad news is so bad. See, if you'll circle the world word there in verse 18, sins, you can write your own name next to that, sinner, you know? Just, you can write my name. Just go ahead and write my name, Scott. Okay, but, but know that your name should be there too. The unjust, the just for the unjust, you can also put your middle name next to that, the unjust one, you know, or your last name or whatever. It's talking about us there, I hate to tell you. The Bible teaches that there's no one good, no, not one. Now, most people immediately think of an exception, like their grandma or something. They go, yeah, but my grandma's so good, you know, and, Okay, but the Bible says, no, not one, not even grandma. Oh, come on. No, the good news is good, but the bad news is bad, which is there's no, not one, except one, which the Bible said there was one that was good, Jesus. That's the good news. And that good one suffered for the bad ones. And his goodness was good enough for all of the bad that he suffered for our sin, that he paid the penalty there, that the just died for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the good for the not so good. And so the God life, the good life, we see it right there. That's what brings us now to verse 19. Now, here's the thing. Every commentary I looked at, and I looked at a lot, every study Bible that I looked at, and I looked at a lot, every resource I could find, this is how it introduced this section right here. Verses 19 to 22 are some of the most difficult and debated verses in the New Testament. But this is the Wednesday crowd, so we're going to stick through this with some scripture study here, and I hope that we'll bring some clarity to the clouds. It, it can be a little difficult here, but hey, you know what? God's word, we should expect sometime that God is going to require us to think. And so let's think as we look at this. Verse 19, it says, By whom? Also he, it's talking about Jesus there, went and preached to the spirits in prison 
who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Say what? Now, what you see, I'm going to have you write down three cross-references real quick. Okay, write them down now, look them up later, think them through. Hopefully, again, it'll clear up some of the cloudiness. The, the first one I want you to write down is 2 Peter 2.4. You can put that in your margin right next to this scripture. So if anyone ever says, hey, what does 1 Peter 3.19 mean? And you say, well, let's go look at 2 Peter 2.4. Same author, human, and so he gives a similar thought there, and it sheds some additional light on it. Also, Jude verse 6. And you say, well, what chapter? There's only one chapter in Jude. Hey, Jude, you only have one chapter. Okay, so it's verse 6 of Jude. And then, to make it easy on you, Genesis 6, that whole chapter. If you write down those three, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 6, Genesis 6, let me summarize the puzzle that many have put together here. The time right before Noah's ark, right there, Noah's flood, was one of the most wicked times in human history. We think right now it's pretty bad, you know, and everything. But remember, this is a time that God had to destroy the whole place. You know, and there was a lot of demonic activity that's described there. And it looked very much, if you were to just look at it, like Satan's side was winning and God's side was losing. That that's what was happening here. And 1 Peter 3.20, right here, we look at it together. It says only eight people were saved in Noah's Ark. I mean, lots of animals and all the rest, but you know, all dogs could go to heaven and all that. But eight people, only eight in the whole world had God's life. Now think about that for a moment. Everyone else in Noah's day, you may say, man, it's pretty rough where I work, or it's pretty rough in my neighborhood or where I go to school. Eight people in the whole world. Everybody else was living la vida loca. All right, that's very important. Trying to find the good life. Yeah, man, I don't need the God life. I'll go for the good life. And only Noah, they thought he was living the crazy life old crazy Noah and the family there, but they chose God's way. And Noah had a very hard life, 100 years plus. You see him being ridiculed. You see people going, it looks like rain, Noah. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Another sunny day. You know, and all the rest of that while he's building the boat. They'd never seen rain. Discouragement, I'm sure. And yet, in the light of eternity, looking back now, who was right? Well, I think Noah got the last laugh. He had the good life, really, after all, didn't he? Now, we got past there, verse 20, by talking about Noah there. But what about verse 19? This one's a little more interesting. It says that Jesus went to preach to spirits in prison. Did you know Jesus did prison ministry? What is it talking about there? Well, best answer I can give, again, when you see Jesus, you can ask him if I was right. Jesus was dead for three days. We know that part to be true. The Bible says that very clearly. His body in the tomb, his spirit... Well, the spirit is eternal. It doesn't die. Your body goes to the grave, but your spirit does not. And so where was his spirit during those three days, during that three-day span? Well, apparently he was on a spiritual speaking circuit, and one of the places he visited was a spiritual prison. What's it talking about there? Well, again, cross-referencing those verses that I gave you there, Peter tells us that he had a message there in Hades, that's the word used, in Sheol, a spiritual place for the demons, fallen angels. What was his message to them? Well, at the cross, as in Noah's day, it looked pretty much like good lost and bad won. But Jesus gave a speech that said, hey, guess what, guys? Good won and evil lost. And he made that proclamation, and he makes it still to us today. And remember that every speech has really two sides. If it's a victory speech, well, somebody lost, right? If, if a coach is given that victory speech, some other team is, you know, kind of nursing their wounds. And so you see a victory speech, the winning side, a declaration also to the losing side. To the falling angels there, you lose. To those on God's side, we won. I love it because Pastor JP, you know, in his Bible, as he is the children's pastor here, you know, and the family pastor, and one of the things he has on the back page of his Bible, he put in a little sticky note right here on the back page, and it says, the end, we win. And I love that. It's just so simple. Oh, yeah, that's good to remember, isn't it? Now, if you haven't already lost the thread, let's go to verse 21. This is both the joy 
and the challenge of verse-by-verse teaching. We don't avoid things, but boy, sometimes we have to dive into them. Look at verse 21. It says, There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 21 has also been a very controversial and confusing verse for some. Some would say, well, man, does, does that say baptism saves us? Does, isn't that what it says, that this that now saves us, baptism? Well, again, you've got to look at it all the way through. And some would say, well, what's the antitype? Does that have anything to do with the antichrist? Are those related? Have nothing to do with each other. An antitype is just a fancy word. You know, everybody's got to have a few fancy words, you know, SAT words to make themselves look smart. And so Peter throws it in here. It's a word that means symbol, a symbol. A picture. And so Peter's using Noah's ark there as an analogy. It's in that context of Noah's ark that he's also talking about baptism. Again, water and all the rest in that picture. And so Peter's using Noah's ark first. He talks about that and he says, you know what? God was painting a picture of salvation in both of these things. An Old Testament, a New Testament picture there intermixed. And Noah, you see, his family was saved from the flood by getting in the ark, right? I mean, that was important. They got in the ark and it says, God shut the door and all the rest of that. And the waters washed the old world away. I mean, they got in and there was wickedness all around. They got out and it was nice and fresh and clean. And you see that and in a similar way, you know what what you see is we are saved by getting into Jesus. Not by getting into the water. That's not the point. The point is the water was actually the washing away thing. That was the judgment actually of God. But what is it that was the salvation? Well, the ark was the salvation. And so you see that as you are inside, as you are in Christ, as the Bible puts it. Well, water baptism is just a picture of that salvation. Water doesn't save anybody. That's what Peter even says. It's just an outward sign of an inward change. And if there's no inward change, well, then there's no value in the symbol, no significance to the symbol. But if there's an inward change, oh, there's great Great significance to the symbol. I think of it this way. I wear a wedding ring. You can go buy a wedding ring and it doesn't make you married. It's a great symbol, but it doesn't change anything really. But you know, because I am married and happily so, I love to wear this ring as a reminder because it is a symbol with significance. And so Peter's very careful to say that in verse 21. He says, it's not the symbol that saves. It's not the washing of the water or the filth of the flesh. That's not what I'm talking about. He says, it's the resurrection. That's really what does it. The thing that the, it symbolizes. That's what baptism is a picture of. And that's one of the reasons I so love doing them. We'll have a baptism video coming up and we'll be having another baptism coming up. So if you miss that one, you'll actually want to do this if it's something you've never done. Why? Because it's an important and beautiful act of obedience. It's something that God commanded because it's a good thing. Sometimes I think, oh, this is pretty tough. Go down to the beach on a beautiful day, enjoy a burger and a hot dog, and get dunked. Wow! Wow, Lord, that's so tough. We suffer so here in Miami. No, it's an awesome, beautiful thing. His commands are not burdensome. It's an identification of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Death to the old life, alive to the new. That's the God life. And you might say, okay, Scott, I want it. I want it. I want to live that. Where do I get it? Well, look at what the last verse of chapter 3 says. This is clear. However confusing the first two that we looked at there, this one should be very clear. It says, He has gone into heaven and, and is at the right hand of God angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. In other words, Jesus is in the place of absolute authority. If you want to have the good life, if you want to have the God life, well, the very obvious answer is to go to God to get it. You know, God, I want the life that you give. Let me go to you for it. And God's son, the Bible says, is the way to come to God, the way to go to God. In heaven at the right side of God the Father, you see God the Son. And that makes him very different than any other good man in history. Although there have been some, I suppose. You know, at least good relatively in human terms. But he was God as a man. And so let's go back and ask the question that I began with there. Are you living the good life? Are you living the good life? Can you say, absolutely, I am living 
the good life. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt the good life is the God life because I have the life that God gives. Well, see, it's the life there that Jesus came to live and to give. You may know that the theme verse of this church, you know, really the one word that encapsulates our mission here is life, the word life. And it comes from John 10.10 10, where Jesus said, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the devil. That's his work. But God's work, he says, I have come for a different reason, that you might have life and have it to the full, that you might have it more abundantly. And so God has promised us eternal life. That's great. But we don't have to wait till we die to start experiencing it. I love that because what it means is that right now we can have the abundant life. Right now we can be living the good life that God has for us. It can affect our relationships. We can have good relationships. You know, doesn't mean that we'll never have struggles in those things. But you see, we can have good relationships. We can have good results. We can know that no matter what's going on in our life, hey, God's going to turn this around for good. And we have some good reasons to believe these things. They are based on fact. Now, I want to end today with a story. And it's kind of a, a long story, but I think it's one that is worth sharing. It's unfolding and has unfolded just this month. And it's a very personal story for, uh, from our family and, and all the rest. But I want to share this story with you because it involves you. And you might say, well, how does it? Well, because many of you have been praying for our family. You know, and, and I want to show you in a very interesting and practical way how your prayers are being answered. Some of you are saying, well, I haven't prayed for your family. We'll do it right now and we'll include you in this whole thing. <laughs> But so many of you have prayed for our family to be blessed, to be strengthened, to sense God's nearness. Why? Because our son Stephen is going through a leg lengthening process. You know, he was born with one leg shorter than the other, and because of that, he's going through a, a very painful and difficult 10 month process uh, in which they uh, stretch out that bone and all the rest of that. Now, I think God knew just how to answer your prayers for our blessing in a way that would blow our minds. I mean, it wasn't what you prayed, but it's what happened. It's how God answered it. And the most amazing part of it is not what happened or who it happened with, but how and when it happened in our life. That's what I really want to focus on. Again, it's been a rough season. And so our son, Stephen, there... He has a basketball for a brain. That's one of the other uh, things that he was uh, born with there, a basketball for a brain. If you look in the, uh, in the ultrasounds, it had the little uh, black things on it, you know. He loves to play it. He loves to watch it. He loves to talk about it. I mean, having dinner at our house, it's like sitting there at the ESPN Sports Center thing. I mean, it's just the facts and figures and everything else. That's, that's what goes on. And it's, it's kind of a joke on me in a sense because I'm, I, before him, I was the least sports-oriented guy that had ever walked the planet probably. My wife even met me and couldn't believe that there was a male who had, couldn't name a, a current player of any sport. I was like, I don't know, you know. <laughs> I was naming guys who had been dead for 20 years, you know, and stuff when she asked me. And, and so two summers ago here, Stephen went to a basketball camp, and he used his own money for that, and he was so excited. I mean, just this summer camp, he looked forward to it forever, and guess what? He got sick right before it, just really sick, and it was a huge disappointment. I mean, just a massive disappointment. It didn't live up to any of his expectations, and of course, on top of it, he just felt miserable. I mean, almost didn't go several of the days. There was only one little faint bright spot through the whole thing, which is that he got a poster there from the Miami Heat, a Miami Heat poster. It was from the championship year, and it was a very unique poster. You know, it was like almost four feet long and, and tall. It had every player in relief, and it was from the championship year back then. And it was a really cool poster, and he just kind of like rolled it up and brought it home and all the rest of that. Now, here's miracle number one. Let me give you miracle number one. That poster somehow survived for two years in our garage. You say, what's the miracle about that? Have you seen our garage? No. <laughs> it looks like your garage, all right? Only worse. Without being crushed. And I would periodically look over and go, is that that poster? I'd forgotten all about that poster. Oh man, we got to frame that thing before it gets killed. And then I'd, you know, have an ADD moment and just go off and do something else. <laughs> now, I'd always think someday I got to do this, you know, frame it. Now, someday finally came, and Lynn, you know, is actually the one who saw it. She decided to redo Stephen's room 
with a, a Miami Heat theme. You know, she was going to do that and, and frame that print. Now, she had a coupon. Lynn always has a coupon. There's no miracle there. But, she, uh, but the timing of it, there was a half-off coupon for the framing job, you know, there. And so they said it'll be ready on this certain day. Well, that certain day came and went, and there were delays and delays and delays. That, that thing had to be special ordered. There was some special matting and everything, you know, just had to be exactly right and all the rest of that. And blah, 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 it's in an order. We don't have it here. We thought we had it. We don't have it. The store is out of it. We'll have to, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. And we just spent time dropping by, asking, you know, in the neighborhood, hey, just happened to be calling. Is it here yet? You know, all that. Finally, on the phone, I did what I'd call barking at them, okay? You know, kind of, I didn't tame my tongue too well. Now, you would say, Pastor Scott. Well, what can I say? All right. It wasn't a bad bark. I'm just letting you know, Lynn described it this way. It was a bark for you, but it wasn't a bark for anybody else, you know? But, but they finished it. They finished it. I guess they thought my bite might be worse than my bark. So... Saturday morning, we go, sleepy little store in Homestead. You know, they call it Home Dead. They used to, you know, but we live there, you know. And only one other customer in the whole place, in the line in front of us. The framer asked that customer there if it'd be okay to just kind of go in the back and get our poster because, see, they recognized us, you know. <laughs> then we came in the door and they're like, oh, boy, here they are. Yes, just get them and get their print out of here, you know, before he bites us. Unwraps this thing from the butcher paper that was in. Awesome. I mean, just Wow, museum quality, the thing phenomenal, worth the wait. And the customer even commented on it and said, wow, that looks good. That's awesome. I have some posters like that. Maybe I'll get it done similar, you know. And so we started just conversing, just talking there. You know, hey, we're having this done for our son, you know. And, and, and he, he got home from the hospital just this week and everything else. We're real excited about showing it to him or redoing his room and this is kind of going to be the centerpiece of it and all that and he loves basketball and he loves the heat but he especially loves Dwayne Wade from the heat you know and that customer mentioned that he was having some pictures framed also and he said yeah it's for an auction that's going to be held and so at this point Lynn being much more observant than I noticed that the pictures he was having done were collages of Dwayne Wade autographed you know and so she asked the guy there hey um where's the auction is it being held locally you know maybe nobody will show up and we can bid a dollar and <laughs> and all that sort of thing as long as we're having a miracle moment might as well do that and the customer just casually said you know oh, i can get more of these that's my son now i'm pretty sure sometime in life have you ever had an echo moment where, like, God puts reverb on something? That's my son, 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 son. <laughs> and he, he excuses himself and says, let me go get my card from out in the car. Now, my mind is always trying to explain away the great things that God is doing. You know, so immediately I, I, I'm thinking, I, I know what he meant. He meant my son does these collages. He's an artist. <laughs> I'm going out to the car, I'll be happy to sell you some of this stuff, that kind of stuff. Now, Lynn, being much more spiritual and listening at that moment, says to the framing guy who I barked at earlier, did he just say that Dwayne, is, Dwayne Wade is his son, that he's Dwayne Wade's dad? And he said, yeah, that's him, I've seen him on TV. So just then, this man comes back inside, hands me his business card, and says, like it's, no big deal. I'm Dwayne Wade Sr., and uh, I'd like to see what we could do to be a blessing to your son. I remember what I said. I said, <laughs> and then eventually I said, uh, this is, this is a miracle moment. I said, I don't think you understand. This is, this is more than, than just you know, a celebrity or whatever else. This isn't the point. That your son is the one person on the planet, I would say, that my son would most want to meet. You know, I mean, just really on, on just, if, if I were to ask him, and I have before, who would you most want to meet, you know, other than Jesus and those types of answers? On this planet, right now, who would you most want to meet? I don't know, Dwayne Wade? 
So I told his dad there, hey, listen, I know your son has a million fans, you know, all the rest, but I don't think he has probably another one like Stephen. You see, years ago, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. Right then I had to apologize to the guy I barked at. I said, hi. <laughs> God has a way of humbling you right in the middle of miracles, man. Hi, I'm <laughs> Pastor Scott, and uh, sorry about that there. But let's get on to other things. So I said, listen, I, I told my son years ago, look, it's great to have favorite players. Of course, I mean, you love basketball, you're going to love a great basketball player. But listen, don't just cheer for them, pray for them. They are real people with real hurts, real problems, real pressures. We look on and say, oh, they got the good life. Well, you know what? Everybody has the same struggles. And so often they maybe have pressures that we don't even have. And so many people are there to idolize them and all the rest of that, but how many people really go to sleep praying for the people who maybe mean something to them in their life? So I said, you know what, Stephen, we're going to do that. We're going to commit to doing that. If there's somebody who we watch a game and you see someone get hurt, we're going to pray for that guy that night. If you see someone play well, pray that they would do it in a way that the pride doesn't puff them up and that they stay humble so that God can continue to bless them. So as a family, we often pray for the players, you know, the coaches and the families, and I'm not kidding. For years, we have prayed. I've sat at my son's bed while we prayed for Dwayne Wade and his family for the, God to bless him. And God bless him right now. I think they're playing, you know. <laughs> but as a dad, I, it, it, less I sound spiritual, you know. As a dad for years, I've also dreamed and schemed, you know, of getting Stephen an autograph. I, I, but not like just going buy one. I mean, that's dumb. You know, I, I wanted to, I'm like, you know, to somehow get him something autographed or, or you know <laughs> to meet him well that would be pretty cool too again not because we worship him but because for some reason whatever reason he's a special person in my son's life now how about this you know i i'm thinking in my mind so many times he's unreachable he's a gold medalist he's a world, world champion he's an mvp you know he, he's the leading scorer in the nba this year i mean you know he's not just a basketball player you know, out there somewhere. And suddenly here we were with his dad introducing himself to us. I mean, it's not me trying to chase him down through some PR channel. His dad saying, hey, we'd like to be a blessing to you. Could we do that? He asked us more about the surgery, and I told him this. You know what, my, my son has one leg shorter than the other, and, and he has different sized feet. You know, he was born with different sized feet. And I don't know if you know, if you have teenagers or you've ever been one shoes, Man, shoes are it, aren't they? You know, they're just so important. And he's always had to buy two pairs of shoes, you know, and, and, and two, that, two that didn't fit. He's had to do that, you know, custom shoe lift. It's just been this cycle. And so he, he always wanted the Dwayne Wade models. That's what he wanted. His Christmas money would always go to that. And over the years, lots and lots of odd extra shoes. Brand new shoes that never got used. And so Lynn made them part of this Miami Heat room, you know. There's little shelves on there, you know. And, and this is what I asked his dad. I said, listen, is there just a possibility? I, I, could I be this bold to ask? Is there a possibility we could get one of those shoes signed? Could we just get one of those shoes signed? Somehow, you know, mail it, whatever. Oh, definitely we can do that, he says. We can get that done. When you meet Dwayne, you can just ask him to do it. He'd be happy to do it. <laughs> What? You know? And so we gave him our phone number, you know, and it took, I think, several tries to get it right. What's our phone number, you know? Uh, here, take my phone. I don't know. Uh, we gave him his address. We go, oh, go home, and we're like, did that just happen? Did it, I was there. Were you there? Did that just happen? But this is the part that God wanted to do in my life, too. The waiting. The waiting? You ever had a miracle moment and then you have to wait? And the phone didn't ring and the letter didn't come. And why didn't he call back, you know? We missed each other a few times, you know? It's like this message left, that message left. And then there was a silent period. No call. No call. Should I call? You ever had one of those ones? Do I call? Do I not call? Should I call? <laughs> Get all the digits? No, I'm not going to call. I'll email. No, I'll text. No, I don't know. Text. Should I call him? I lost sleep over it. I, I, I will tell you, I lost sleep over this issue. 18 days passed between the day that we met Dwayne Wade Sr. 
and Dwayne Wade Jr. And I can tell you it felt like 18 years. I think I aged that long. <laughs> but I was along the way saying, God, when you do this, I'm going to tell this story for your glory and I'm going to make you look smart like you always are and I'm going to make me look dumb like I always have to look. Because again, I'm ashamed to say in my life, I really am, that I was fretting and doubting like some kind of neurotic person. And along the way, God was saying, Scott, yes, God, did you arrange the first meeting? No, I tried to mess it up. <laughs> well, then what makes you think you have to arrange the second meeting? Oh, busted. Should have trusted. So some more time passed. Last home game of the season, if you know their schedule, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago to this day. It happened to be a Wednesday night. Maybe you guys remember Jesus in 3D. Who was teaching here last Wednesday? Well, I was two weeks ago, 6.30 p.m. Let me give you a little window into what happened at our house. The family's just getting ready to get in the car. We're getting Stephen in. He's had one of the worst days of pain he's had in a long time. And we're just getting ready to get into the car, and ring my phone. Of course, who's on the other side? Hi, this is Dwayne Wade Sr. Can you and Stephen come to the game tonight? I got a couple tickets here for you. You know, I didn't say that, so I mute. Oh, Lord, no, 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 no. How can you do this to me? Do you know what this is? 6.30, man, I got to teach. Didn't you look at my schedule? <laughs> Sonic. <clears throat> Dwayne. <clears throat> Dwayne, can you, can, can, you hold, can you hold on just a sec? Then can you call Pastor Pedro? I'm feeling sick. No, I, I didn't do that. I thought about it. I thought about it. I said, Lynn, can you go with Steve into the game and meet Dwayne Wade? Now, check this out. From the other room, this is what I hear. Stephen saying this. Dad, listen, this whole thing's been about God from the beginning. Don't think, I don't think we should thank him by ditching church to go to a basketball game. I'm like, what have you done with my son? <laughs> now, right then, again, my mind, wheel spinning, I'm thinking, Stephen sounds pretty spiritual. Maybe I'll have him do the teaching. Len and I will go to the <laughs> All this is happening in a, you know, a matter of a couple seconds. I get back on the phone, and I told Dwayne's dad, I'm sorry, we can't do it. Uh, I'm teaching tonight. And he said, okay, well, some other time then. And I was dying inside. I mean, right then, I'm like, Rrr. I can feel everything, like my miracle is going away. <laughs> and just then he says, wait, wait, Scott, you know what? Why don't you just come after the game? Why don't you just come after the game? 10 p.m., the game will be over somewhere in there. We'll be there. So I did the teaching, as you know, if you were here, 9 p.m. In Jesus' name, amen. And everyone go, what? <laughs> Where did Scott go? Jumped in the Jeep, down to the arena, and met the Father and the Son. Now, the best part of it, our whole family got to go. And we met his family, the family that we'd been praying for for all that time. And they were very generous. They were very gracious. They treated us like friends uh, more than fans. His, his dad was actually taking pictures of our family on his camera. You know, he's like, oh, hey, 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 hey. Now, again, I tell this story not to bring attention to Dwayne Wade. He has enough of that, really. Or to our family, but to God. See, I want you to think this through with me, and I'll, I'll be brief here, but I, I, I need to share these things with you. All these years, I was hoping that someday, some way, I might get one of Stephen's shoes signed. You know, because somehow those shoes, I, I, I don't know how even to express this to you fully, but every time I tried to even think it through today, I just ended up crying about it that many times I would go out into the garage and I would see those shoes and somehow those shoes with their lift and everything were just an embodiment of sometimes the pain and frustration and Stephen would wear those things out so fast and we were always having to deal with these things and it was just one of these things that sometimes I would just end up crying in the garage and then I'd see that poster again like, oh, I've got to fix that someday, you know. <laughs> one shoe sign. That was my hope. And instead, God arranged for Dwayne Wade to hand Stephen a pair of his shoes signed. 
And Lynn, that very morning, had put a verse on Facebook as her little thing. It said, Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do abundantly above all we ask or think. And so as we were driving home from that arena, you know, the kids were talking even on the phone with grandparents and stuff. It wasn't about Dwayne Wade. That's what I loved about it. It wasn't about him. It was about God. The whole way home, it was like, God just, I guess, wants to bless us. And see, that was a great lesson for the kids, of course. But this big kid needed to learn it too. That somehow the incredibly important person of Jesus cared about what I cared about. And cared about those shoes that sometimes I'd cried over and said, man, you know, why has life got to be so hard? And I learned a lot in that day about how God brings good out of bad. See, Stephen went to that camp sick. Remember that? That's bad. Oh, what a waste. He'd even say year, uh, months after, what a waste. I'm so sorry I went to that stinking camp. But it was at that camp that he got the poster that eventually led to this whole thing. Oh, that's good, I guess. The camp was good. See, I thought it was bad. See, the framing was delayed, and we got frustrated, and I barked at the guy on the phone, and, and that was bad, right? Well, the delay was divine, and see, it needed to be at that exact moment for us to meet Dwayne's dad, and so that was good. And it was even good that I barked at the guy. Why? Because I got to humble myself in front of him and even share with him how this was a God moment and how I had struggled against it. See, the most profound part to me, though, is this. This is what I want to leave us with. Verse 22, it says it finishes the chapter there with that simple truth that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God. What does that mean to us? It means that we have absolute, total access to God the Father through Jesus the Son. See, remember how this whole thing started? It was with those echo words. That's my son, 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 son. And see, there comes a moment in our life where we see that and God points and says, that's my son. See, when we got to that arena, we just followed Dwayne's dad everywhere, you know, and there's that family connection. He just, everywhere you go, I'm Dwayne Wade Sr., and, uh, you know, the things would, uh, would part there. They just say, they're with me, they're with me, and we got to go where we would never otherwise get to go. We met the father all the way down in Homestead, but he brought us quickly enough to the son. And it shouldn't come as any shock, I suppose, in light of that, when the Bible says, that that father-son connection will actually be working for us in heaven. It's our way to heaven. That Jesus the Son gives us total access to God the Father. And when we honor the Son, the Bible says we honor the Father and vice versa. See, Jesus said in himself, no one comes to the Father except by me. And people will push back against that. But then you hear that story and you go, well, of course, of course. See, we saw it there that Jesus died and rose again for a reason, to bring us to God. That's what he did. The just for the unjust, the good for the bad, to give us the good life, to give us God's life. Well, God, we thank you tonight for the opportunity we've had to rejoice in you. God, to remember that the good life isn't just about things or having everything go right for us. But Lord, it is when we realize that we have a relationship with you that can start now and never end. And God, thank you that you reached down to us, that we don't have to be good enough for you because we can't be. But Lord, that you were good enough to come looking for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for demonstrating it by sending the greatest gift that could possibly be given, the love and life of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.